Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the last of the introductory talks. So you'll have to bear with a little bit more history and so on. And of course, it's a little bit boring for most of you, but maybe tells you a little bit about what this actual milestone means to some of us who've been in this project for a very long time. So, as you've been told already, this is a long standing project. It was first proposed to ESA in 1993 as two separate satellites, COBRAS and SAMBA. And you saw some nice um, pictures uh, that Reno showed as to what the original concepts were. And in fact, we were given the task to bring these two projects together into one super project, if you like, at the time. And this is a picture of what our first uh, concept uh, satellite was called Cobra Sama. That is the union of these two initial projects. And we were quite lucky because uh, uh, Cobra Samba was selected in 1996, so quite quickly after the first concepts were presented. This is rather unusual in, in space projects, I would say, and, and therefore even though this is a already a 20 year project, it's actually gone rather quickly through all of its phases tells you something about the space business, I think. Okay. So this Cobra Samba satellite uh, was selected in 1996, and it consisted basically of putting together, in a not very smart fashion, I would say, Cobras and Samba, so that we ended with two uh, uh, arrays of receivers on this concept. One was based on hemp. Uh, uh, arrays and the other one on bolometer arrays. And just to remind you as well that this first project was meant to be launched in 2003. And this was the state of the art of the uh, power spectrum of the CMB at the time. And you can see that it was indeed early days and we have come a long way since then. This is pulled from the so-called Red Book which was the the essentially the proposal for Cobra Samba in 1995, 96 it was written. And you can see that uh, the measurements were not that great. They were indicating a first peak, uh, but that was about it. So there was great promise in this, uh, in this mission. And in fact, what we said in the red book that we would deliver was the spectrum here that you see on the right. And you can see it was rather less ambitious, I would say, than what we are actually achieving today at the time. Now, you may have heard of the so-called first Planck years, which were uh, sad years for many of us, but uh, I could not resist pulling out of my archives one of the designs that we were toying with at the time. And you can see there a kind of monster uh, uh, idea which consisted of Herschel cryostat, which actually contained HFI instrument in the Christ at the time. And at the, at the other end of the satellite, a second telescope, which was actually uh, catering to the LFI instrument, at that time the COBRAS instrument. So this was a particularly preposterous uh, design of a series of designs that we toyed with at the time. But eventually reason prevailed, and that's, that's what matters in the end. And we had the so-called carrier concept uh, selected for Planck, and this was a concept where uh, already Planck and Herschel were going to be launched on the same rocket, and Planck was actually carrying Herschel on its shoulders, which is something that also changed afterwards, but this was a, a much more reasonable design at the, t at the time. And when this converged, the idea was that we would be launching in 2007. And I think you know, if you think of the fact that we did launch in 2009, this is not at all a bad achievement. I mean, a two-year delay in such a big mission, which at that time consisted of two big satellites, was, uh, uh, I think, quite an achievement. Now, at the same time as we were toying with the satellite design, we were also uh, uh, reviewing the uh, detailed instrument proposals at the time, and they were accepted in 1998. Uh, uh, as proposed by the two PIs who you heard uh, words from just before me. And the major change in these instruments with respect to the previous Cobra Samba design 
was that LFI was now cooled to 20 Kelvin, whereas in the previous design it was basically passively cooled to something like 100 Kelvin. And this was quite a major change from a technical point of view. And it was kind of forced on us uh, uh, by circumstances on the one hand because, of course, <coughs> MAP had been selected at that time and we had to do better. But also we had a bit more time to play with the design and that was something we have to thank for to first and the first Planck uh, uh, merging, if you like. And uh, shortly after uh, this story, we uh, asked industry to uh, uh, start building the two satellites. And uh, I also want to say here a word of thanks to Thales Alenia Space, which has done such a wonderful job on Planck. Now, in 2003, we had, the, let's say, the, the, most, the biggest change in the payload concept since uh, 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 their selection, and that was the sad event where we lost the LFI 100 gigahertz channel on LFI for a number of reasons, which I think it's not worth uh, going into detail in, in addition because they might elicit some uh, moaning and groaning, etc. And, uh, however, there was a gain in this, and that is that we gained uh, polarimetry on the HFI 100 gigahertz, which we did not have at the time. So we lost a big component of the LFI. We gained also something on the HFI. And that's the finished product. I mean, you've seen pictures of this. This is the assembled satellite uh, not long before it was uh, shipped to uh, Kourou for launch. And, of course, this was the our moment of glory in May of 2009, almost exactly four years ago, where uh, the two satellites were launched flawlessly, uh, 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 exactly at the <coughs> opening of the launch window, and separated, allowing Planck <coughs> to proceed to its final orbit around the L2 point uh, in space. And so, I have to show this picture here because it was also a big milestone for us. It was basically uh, a PR milestone, if you like, but it made a big impact just as much internally on our collaboration as externally, I think, is this beautiful map that we composed from the first two all-sky surveys that we made and that we published or made available to the public uh, in 2010. Of course, now the situation is much better, and we can show you basically the uh, full glory of Planck uh, in the form of its nine frequency maps that you can now all play with as much as we have played in, in the last few months within the collaboration. Now, I want to say a little bit about the performance of Planck, because of course that's important. And I start with this slide, which is the slide that I carried around for many years uh, when I gave talks on Planck, which was basically summarizing the goal we had in terms of the performance of Planck. Now, of course, we can forget that one and we can look at the real in-flight performance and it's summarized in these tables where we see at the top, you don't need to look at the, num at the numbers, of course, where we see the performance at detector level, if you like, at the ray level. And the thing that is great to see is that the performance in flight is pretty much the same that we measured on the ground. And therefore, we can say that from that point of view, the instruments are already a success. And don't forget that they have been working uninterruptedly for these four years and producing this kind of uh, performance. Now, at map level, we can now <coughs> compare directly what we uh, have on the maps that we are delivering. We have delivered 10 days ago to the public. And you see that in the table below. You can't read the numbers. But what I can tell you is that at all the channels above 143 gigahertz, we are meeting the goal performances that I was carrying around uh, in this slide I showed you before uh, for so many years. And at the lower frequencies, we are within a factor of two 
and better in some cases of that goal so that we are well within the requirements that were set on the instruments at that time. And of course, as you have heard as well, we are not at the end of the road. We will definitely improve on that. With regard to calibration, it's also worth remembering that our goal was to achieve 1% in the CMB channels, and we're doing uh, better than that in most of the CMB channels. So to show you that really we are doing as well as expected or better. Now, uh, 10 days ago, we have delivered a, a number of products to, uh, to the whole community for everybody to use. And there's quite a lot of them, so I thought I would just go quickly through uh, the main products just to guide you. And this diagram is a bit complicated. <coughs> so let me first take you through the main uh, path there, which is our production of CMB maps. No, I don't think so. I think it's fine. And uh, uh, this map, which we had as a goal to produce over as large a part of the sky as we could, and which is mainly used for studies related to non-Gaussianity, isotropy, but also for other things. And for that, we developed specifically component separation techniques, which take away the foregrounds from the frequency maps. And you will hear about the, those in detail uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, forthcoming talks. Now, for uh, parameter extraction, cosmological parameter extraction, we've chosen to go a likelihood route. And the likelihood that we have built, and which is also available to everybody to use, is a hybrid likelihood, which is split into low Ls and high Ls. And for the high Ls, we use essentially power spectra. And mostly cross-power spectra based on HFI detectors. So the highest frequencies which yield the best angular resolution and sensitivity. And the, for the low L uh, part of this likelihood, we have built a special uh, low resolution CMB map and we do a pixel-based likelihood. And this is no good. <laughs> I uh, guess, okay. Okay, so we're back. And uh, so I was at the low L likelihood. And uh, we also have uh, a set of products which are related to lensing, which I think uh, uh, are extremely interesting in, in their own way. And here we have built a lensing deflection map, which in turn yields a power spectrum, which is leading also to a, a likelihood of its own, which is uh, you know, used in conjunction with the CMB likelihood itself. Now, this is the beautiful map that you've all seen and that we uh, love. How good is it, actually? And you will hear in this conference many talks about that. And so I will not go into any detail about that. What I thought I'd do, however, which I, I thought was quite striking, was to pull out a prediction from the so-called Blue Book, which was our science case that we wrote in 2005, so many years ago, when the field was still uh, uh, not very advanced in general. And you see the uh, uh, spectrum at the top is our prediction uh, from the Blue Book, and it's compared on the same scale, essentially, with our current measurements. And I, as I say there, I think images speak louder than words, it's really amazing, actually, how close they look to each other. And one can say a lot of things about that. And I was a little bit worried, George, when I made this plot, because I was wondering, I mean, if the same person has made both of them, should one be suspicious? Right? Right? But then I convinced myself this is not the case, although one person made the plot at the top. I will argue that the plot at the bottom is the product of our collaboration. And it's been looked at and checked over by many people. So I'm confident of this. And it's still amazing. <laughs> now we also deliver astrophysical products. And uh, uh, this diagram, which you find in one of our papers, is kind of trying to guide your, your way through the maze. Because here it becomes more complicated. We use different methods. And we also use ancillary data 
to produce things that are astrophysically significant. So I will not attempt to do that here, but we'll just point you to the, to the papers and to the talks that will uh, go into, into quite a lot of detail. Just to say that there is a lot of products here for the astrophysical community to keep them busy for, for quite a long time. And some of them are quite astonishing, actually, if you think about it, that the Planck satellite is producing maps of carbon monoxide over the whole sky. That's actually quite uh, interesting and astonishing, I would say. Now, I've talked about products, and so I have to say something about our archive, where, from where all the products are available. Uh, you may download them from this address. But there is also a desk here at the conference. If you, if you have the energy and interest for it, you can sit down with people who will guide you as to the use of the archive interface and how to get different products, etc. Of course, you may uh, download all the papers uh, from our website, but also from AstroPH, where they've all been uploaded. So this is going to be the end of my presentation. Uh, let me summarize here. I think from a technical point of view, Planck is already a success. As a satellite, it has really been extremely well behaved. I mean, we haven't had any failures worth talking about. The percentage of time where we have not been acquiring data is really so tiny that it's completely negligible. And it has worked for twice the intended period with a full payload and continues to work uh, now with part of the payload. And I hope you will be convinced at the end of this symposium that with the current release of data and papers, we are already fulfilling many of our scientific objectives. But of course, our road is not finished, as you have heard. We have quite a bit of data which has not been released and that will improve the products that we are releasing uh, today. But in addition, we have the polarization uh, bonanza to look forward to. And so uh, let me wish you a good symposium. I hope there is a lot of discussion and I hope that especially the people from outside the plant collaboration contribute to our understanding of, uh, of the Planck data uh, and science. And I cannot finish without saying once again, and I guess you will hear this repeated many times, that Planck is a very large collaboration which consists of many agencies, institutes, and individual scientists, and we have to thank each and all of them for where we stand today. Okay, so before I finish, I'll just make some practical uh, points regarding the conference. First of all, because we're webcasting, as you know, we need to uh, uh, project all the presentations from central laptops here. And there is a desk outside. Please, you have to deliver your presentation in time for it to be uploaded. So at least half a day earlier would be even better. And you also have to sign a form that says that you allow us to webcast and then to put your presentation online. We'd also like to collect the posters to put them online afterwards, so you can also bring them to the drop-off desk. Uh, let me also say that, because this room is now already quite full, that we have a, another room next door, just 20 meters away, where we are projecting uh, Th these presentations. So if you don't like to be in this overfull room, you can go over there as well. Now, last point I wanted to make is uh, we have a few events planned. Uh, we have this public session tomorrow evening, and we have a conference dinner um, uh, on Thursday evening. Uh, places are limited because, particularly for the public session, we would like local people to come as well. And I think you were asked to say if you wanted to attend or not. If you have changed your mind about that, please let the desk know, and that frees a place for other people. 
There is a small change in the program, which I'd like you to note, and that, uh, uh, in, in fact, it's just a change in the titles of, uh, of the two talks on component separation, which are coming up, which are wrongly uh, labeled in your programs. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. So indeed, we're back on time. We have even time.